Hi, Jose. How are you? I'm good, Etienne. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. Jose, the last time we met in person was a f- more than a few months ago, but you told me that you were working on a project and what you were doing really caught my attention, piqued my curiosity. So um, I want to, I was curious just to learn more about what you have uncovered in this project because it had to do with trends in learning and the future of learning. And, yes. Um, so yeah, what, what, what was the context for that? So it was um, an interesting project where you want to change um, a few things, right? You want to change like the culture in the organization to make it more uh, prone to, uh, to learning and to um, supporting like, um, like a diverse type of, um, of learning and as well changing um, like the product that actually exists, right? Not so much one, um, like one, um, like one model fits all, right? So try, and, try to understand that and trying to, to see how we could move it forward. So in terms of that is, yeah, it's a government organization that is, um, that used to have like over a, 10 years ago, a type of program for a specific type of analyst, right? And that got like um, eliminated through the years. And so um, now in 2020, they have to be, uh, came to the understanding that, yeah, there's something missing there and there's some gaps in the learning and there's something need to be put in place so these people can continue to do an effective role and they can continue to support the organization efficiently. So that's where the project came to be. So in that terms, I, I started to do some, um, some research about what's happening out there mostly like uh, what's happening in the trends of corporate learning outside government, as well as in other organizations. And that's where um, uh, some of the ideas for this project came. So that's going to be interesting because you don't come from a learning background. Uh, you come from a project management background, an IT background, a bit of a design thinking and a agile project management. So uh, being exposed to the state of learning was something new. So I'm really curious to, to hear what, struck you what caught your attention um given that it's not your background necessarily so uh i think you touched on some of those things like design thinking i think is something that we can apply to anything same as some type of project management so um so i think like uh when i was like so uh, there was an opportunity to um, learn throughout other projects and other assignments. So I think that's where um, my interest was picked into this. And I said, like, okay, corporate learning. I don't have a background on this, but I think we could um, definitely, like, it's something I can learn. And I, and I think um, I've all, also worked in other parts of HR before. So I think it will be a complement mm-hmm. to that. Yeah. Um, so I've worked on, on revamping the onboarding experience and also working on like the whole like um, transformation of the HR process in government. So I thought that was a complement to that. So that's where um, I think those skills came like said, okay, we can apply this. And I thought it was very interesting because it's also learning something that is new to me and how the policy process works. So I think it will add to my, uh, to my experience on that sense. Tell me what are some of the trends that you uh, have identified in the literature about uh, how organizations can provide learning to their employees? Sure. I think one of, uh, I think the main trend trend right now is personalized learning. Um, Given that uh, we're moving into a a world where it's by giving people the ability to uh, pick and choose based on their learning um, like their, their, yes, exactly. But also the way they learn, right? Because everybody uh, learns differently, right? So having different products that give you the, 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 the opportunity to, to, um, to try different things and to, to make it like relevant to your learning goals. So, um, so I think the other, uh, there is like, it has to be relevant and timely, right? So you want products that you can uh, access when you need them. So if you're working on a specific thing, you don't want to have to go back to training that you took eight months ago when you just started a new job and you thought that was going to be relevant. And then you didn't have an opportunity to really put it into practice until this day. 
and then that's not going to be very useful. You have forgotten pretty much everything, and then going back is not going to be that great. So you want training that is going to be there for you when you really need it. So personalize, timely, or just in time. Yeah. What else? What else? I think uh, training that is diverse as well, something that allows you to maybe learn knowledge and also an opportunity to build like a skill that ha is hands on. So not so much like, um, I think like most of the training in government right now is, is uh, okay, you go through this deck or you go through uh, to this um, workshop, but it's mostly like hearing someone talk to you and things like that. I think we have to have an opportunity to not so much like get that knowledge, but also put it in practice, mm. whether it's at work or at some time of, um, or somewhere that allows you to, to put that into, into practice. Have you come across any uh, advice on, on, on measuring or, or just determining whether learning has actually happened? Like whether the employee is taking something away from, from the activity? Oh, well, I think there is a, a few um, tools that are currently used like surveys and things like that. But um, I think uh, it's still too early to really know, like, um, to measure that, right? Because we really need to, uh, to really change the culture and start um, having a, like a different approach to learning. Because we really talk about like the future of, of work, but the future of work really in, in terms of learning is, is becoming like lifelong learners, right? So what does that really mean? And what are the opportunities that organizations are gonna create for all of us to become lifelong learners, right? So it's gonna be like um, really changing that culture and, and creating the opportunities for people to, to do that. And that's one part, but the other part is like, how do we uh, have like what products or learning uh, components can we develop that are gonna be relevant, that are gonna be timely, that I can do whenever I need them and that are gonna really be Hands on, and that are going to be really for good for my work. When, like, yeah, pretty much. So, based on what you have observed, either in that organization where you uh, started this project, or, or or previously in your career, what are the things that you would say that uh, we need to stop doing when it comes to learning, and what we need to shift towards? Like, if, to, just to make a clear distinction between the two, how would you describe it? I think the first thing we have to, to stop doing is saying that we prioritize training, but we really don't, right? Um, and secondly, we really need to uh, take a look at what training really looks, really does right now in, in, in the organizations and ask, is this really being valuable or not? So um, just to give you an idea there, just before COVID, when I joined this project, um, a lot of my questions had to do, why is not of a lot of these material already available online? Why is it been digitized? And the answer back then was like, oh, that's not necessary. The way we do it is like the regular type you go and you have an in-person instructor that is gonna have a group of people like that. But now, three months after when COVID has hit, all this training has been moved online because there's no other way to deliver it. So that's a, like, um, that, that shows that there's a need to change and to have different approaches and a different mindset. But uh, yeah, that will take some time. But like, I, like, yeah, we can see some changes there. So that's actually a great segue into a question I was gonna ask you regardless. Uh, what has COVID changed for learning? And uh, both in terms of wh what, what problems did it make really obvious and what opportunities we, we, we should be seizing right now? So it's, um, it made it obvious that we rely a lot of training that is in person and at a place and a specific time and not so much on, on learning that is uh, available all the time and that is relevant, right? So um, I think that was the main thing. And now we're seeing like, okay, a lot of that training has to be put online and people have to be more creative in terms of how is this gonna be delivered and things like that. But there's a lot of, of um, of this already happening in the private sector, right? Universities have been doing it for a while now. And then, so there's a lot that we can really bring on those lessons learned to make uh, learning more uh, uh, digitized. Um, but as well, like uh, in terms of um, making it hands-on, there's a component that really needs to be uh, taken into consideration there because 
I think we teach mostly for um, memory. So we teach you content and we expect people to pretty much memorize or learn that. And somehow they use that knowledge to make it, to really put it into practice. But what we never really give people the opportunities to make this a hands-on experience. But then there's other organizations as, as well, like um, universities like MIT that have come up with modules that really ask the person as they go to be doing the same things, even if it's in small um, components to apply to probably specific examples in the organization so that they have a better understanding of the, uh, of the, of, of the material they're learning so they can put it into, uh, into practice. Nice. Um, so here, here's a, a, a specific case. Recently, I was working on a project uh, that has to do with predictive hiring, which is something novel for the, for the public service. And I packaged some learnings at the end of it Understanding that this is something new, something that we are just starting to discover. Uh, how, how should the learning around this be different than uh, a learning that happens in a setting where what needs to be learned is more in line with ongoing operations? Like it's something that is, that is, um, that it's not new. It's, it, it's meant to provide a foundation of knowledge to everyone and things are going to remain stable for a certain amount of time. Is, should there be a pr different approaches to learning for the, the, the two cases? Or are the, the, the trends that you've observed uh, both applicable in either scenarios? Um, I think that what we will have to evaluate are the goals we would like to accomplish, right? In, those, uh, in both situations. And from there, we will have to really understand like, how can we meet those goals? Is it through uh, the same uh, methods we'll be using? Is it through uh, experimenting with new approaches? Like for example, making them more personalized and things like that. Mm -hmm. But also like if it's something that we really want to incorporate into, into to make it like more work to work, day-to-day uh, -day work, how do we make this more like, um, provide opportunities at work to really incentivize that learning, right? And I think that's also where we fail a lot is like, we have these buzzwords, but we don't go beyond really saying like, okay, how do we create an environment to really change or to really create uh, that, um, like that environment or culture we really, really want to go. So, um, so yeah, I think it will be linked to, to the goals and, and then, you have to look at what are the best approaches based on those learning goals that you would like to. to so what, when you talk about goals, are there different tricks to frame a goal so that you can use it as a, um, as a basis for determining your learning path? Like how, what's, a, what's a good way, a, a convenient practical way of defining a goal for learning? So I think, first of all, the goal has to be realistic, right? So I think when, when, when we start like on a project and we have this big goal, that's the long-term goal, right? Mm -hmm. So I think when we, when we start working with those long-term goals and we just focus on them, we make the mistakes that there are gonna be changes that are gonna help us to go there. So what we need is to have more measurable goals in the long-term that we can uh, make sure that we're collecting the right data so that we can, once we have that, we can evaluate and then we can say, okay, this goal now can it be uh, changed to a higher or a bigger uh, component so that you can, on the long term, arrive to that goal, right? Yeah. So not to have such a big long-term vision, but making uh, make it more like small, concrete, something that you can really like test, evaluate, and then fix easily so that you can have a bigger goal then based on what you have learned before. Are there, so uh, let's say a manager has hired you to come up with a, um, a learning program for a very specific area of the business. Uh, are, what, what would be your approach going into uh, a, a mandate like this? Uh, are, are, regardless of what the, the, the specific line of business is, are there any generic lessons that you would apply going into such a, uh, a project? 
Well, the first is like, you're not the SME, right? So you need to understand like the business and you need to understand what is the end goal, again, that you're trying to achieve based on, on, on the project or, or the, um, the initiative you want to, to have. So based on that, you will need to understand the business and need to understand, okay, this is what we want to accomplish. So what are the, the challenges there? And, what are the, and what's the root cause of the problem? So you need to start having like a conversation and then you have to bring in people that are really experts on that and help drive that discussion so that they understand, okay, um, this is, these, are, these are like the problems that you have identified. I cannot come up with those problems because I've never done that job. I will never understand. You have to be in the job for a while to really understand what is affecting or, or can be improved and things like that. So you need to bring those experts there. And then you need to bring diverse people because like they can challenge each other, right? So as, as you challenge each other, you start to have more common grounds about like, okay, these are like maybe the things that we can concentrate in the short term that we can start changing so that you can get more value and more buy-in as you continue to change the project. Um, the problem is so, one of the things we find is that uh, I think we think too big and long-term and then we don't, really focus on what is affecting us in the moment. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of change management there that needs to happen as well because we need to understand the people and we're working with people. So we need to understand who we're working with and how we're going to change that in order to have a, a real um, impact on what we want to accomplish. So I think we'll, we like understanding first, like the business of the organization, the objectives of the, of the, um, of the project or the initiative, and as well understanding um, what are the challenges you're going to have, you're going to face given the culture that you, you're working on, right? So um, in turn, when it comes to change management, most of us have gone through to school for anywhere between you know, 15 to 20 something years. Uh, when it comes to adapting to the new learning trends, is there a change management aspect that do you, do, have you observed uh, people Resisting new approaches in learning? Oh, completely. I think a lot of people are very um, uh, resistant to online learning. Um, but I think the problem there is uh, so much is that uh, to help change something, we need to provide opportunities for that to happen. So it's not just one time something happens and we have to give up. No, you have to keep pushing and you have to continue to be more creative and come up with ways to um, really engage people, right? So, um, so let me think of um, maybe an example like, uh, so where I'm currently working or on the project I'm currently working, it was hard to engage people. So we had to come like with a way to make them feel like um, they're part of the solution and they're really needed there, right? Because this is, again, I'm not the SME, so I really need people doing the job, the analysts doing the job for them to be really, really, um, for the, the, the project to really bring any value. So it's, it's bringing design thinking and change management and all that into, into play and I'm saying like, okay, we're building with users for users and uh, helping them navigate that change, right? Um, and then resistance, yeah, well, I think there's resistance to a lot of things, but then COVID has also accelerated a lot of those changes, right? There's been resistance to working from home, for example. So there's been resistance to, oh, why can't this be online, right? So interviews had to be in person. Now we see like interviews can be done like how we're talking right now. Uh, tests can be done how we're talking right now. So a lot of things have changed. And now, um, yeah, so those excuses that were put before is because we didn't bring those consent, bring, like bring people together to have a common consensus to, to start changing like what we really want to change. Yeah. The change takes time. So without revealing too much about the, the current project you're working on, uh, what, um, wh where are you taking that project? Like what are the elements, the new practices in, in learning that you're, you want to inc include or embed in that learning program? So, uh, some of the same principles, more personalized uh, learning, allowing, giving uh, the opportunity to have diverse products that, are, that you can uh, use to, to tailor it to yourself, to your own learning needs. Uh, so the idea is to create not just like uh, one product per curriculum that is going to be a 
like to um, that is going to be a, um, open to a group of people for them to decide when and where they want to take that specific uh, training so that it applies to their um, their tenure and so that they can uh, really use it to build those skills they need to do a, an optimal function in the organization right nice and uh, if you look at the future and uh, knowing that things are, are can change really really fast uh, what do you think is um, are the trends that are there to stay? The, in French, we would say tendance lourde. I don't know what's the equivalent in English, uh, but what is there to stay and it's going to maintain the course for a, at least a few years? Yeah. And um, but what are also, uh, in contrast, some of the the emerging trends that we're not yet observing, but things that you're paying attention to because in in a few in two three years there there's a possibility that these things will become the 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 new um the the, the, the newest trend and like and, and and the whole business of learning will be shifting towards that like what, what would be That's the very future? interesting what the future will look, bring but like i think something that is going to be more like uh, multidisciplinary so uh we're going to have the opportunity to be more um multidisciplinary in terms that um, we're going to have access to different type of of, um, of uh, products there, and we're going to be able to de to the uh, to develop different knowledge and skills depending on on our, on our interests. But I also feel like um, so digitalization definitely is here to stay for a while, and and how we use it is going to be very interesting. So there is an opportunity to have also new technologies like virtual reality, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see like why we cannot like we teach medical students to do oper surgeries through virtual reality. Why cannot do do the same for public servants on a specific situation? For example, uh, simulations or uh, trade negotiations and things like that, where people need to really understand the context and things like like to be able to position themselves to to be really uh, able to understand what they're going to be going to be facing. Um, so there's an opportunity there as well to, to experiment with new technologies, the digitalization, having more online content as well, shorter content, not like three, four hours, but like maybe 15 minutes that I on the go, um, that micro learning or things like that mm -hmm. will have maybe here. And I think um, an opportunity as well to have more, um, I think a mix between online and in person, more like uh, the new program we've seen in universities where you have, for example, four months of online and then you have two weeks of in person where you have an opportunity to everything you have learned and, and, and discovered with your group of people to put it really into practice in a specific situation. So I think that's where we're gonna be moving more. And that I think is gonna apply as well to uh, like university and masters and, and other type of, uh, of, of degrees. So if a, um, a, a senior leader in the public service uh, who is not familiar with, with learning uh, and how it works uh, would come to you and ask for advice, what would be the top three advice that you would give him to successfully implement a, a new learning initiative? Understanding that this person is not familiar. Perhaps it, it might be a, a demystifying a common myth that is untrue. Perhaps it would be uh, focusing on a trend that is absolutely unmistakable or uh, perhaps a, a unique insight that you, that you have um, that, that, that came to you from all the research that you've done. So the three things I will advise this person to put in place or... Um, like a, a strategic advice for senior leaders who is not familiar with learning. So I first will be to, uh, to bring the right people uh, to the conversation. You need to have SMEs and you also have to have people with certain uh, skills and mindset to drive the change. Um, second is to, to create opportunities within the organization at that level, in the executive level. For, uh, for the project or the uh, change to flourish, right? Because that's their role as, as champions. They have to help create that buy-in in uh, with other executives in the organization so that that gets like, uh, driven down. Um, and the third will be to, um, 
I guess to provide the, uh, the opportunities for the team to really like experiment and try new ideas and innovate um, because innovation comes from the ground. So the executive must be able to recognize that and really uh, pick up on those opportunities to really support what is really innovative, right? And it's going to really have a, an impact and value in the organization. That's amazing. That's, that's really, really good, uh, good stuff here. Anything that you wish that I would have asked you and that I didn't on the topic of uh, learning trends and future of learning? Uh, in the terms of um, learning, uh, let me see. Uh, maybe the role of HR in, uh, in changing the way we learn. Yeah. So I think, um, I don't know how, um, because the way HR learning is right now, um, embedded into organizations is part of HR, but it's always been like, uh, can I relegate it? So I think uh, it's a time to also think, uh, is this something that has to either evolve out of HR or we have to give them more visibility with just HR, not just the recruitment part, but also the learning and development, right? Because it's the talent part of that, right? And is is the part that we pretty much always forget. We spend too much time on the recruitment, on the attraction, and all of that, but we don't put too much emphasis on the learning and development. So I think that's a conversation that we also have to have, and maybe COVID can help uh, accelerate that conversation into how do we either give them more visibility or make it a separate uh, entity yeah. in uh, organizations. Great point. Great. Well, thank you very much for your time. That was a, a very instructive conversation, and. Uh, we should have done this months ago, <laughs> but I'm glad you made time. I'm glad you made time for me. So thank you very okay. much. We'll talk awesome to you soon. <laughs>